Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our illuminating content. Here is episode 202. Before, I just thought, this is all going to be me. And it's all the pressure and all the stress is on me. But instead, just seeing that, you know, there's almost unlimited resources that God can connect us to the right person, the right information, the right resources at the right time to help on the journey. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's Firestarter is Trisha Goyer. Trisha is a prolific author of more than 70 books. She's a homeschooling mom of 10, grandmother of four, and wife to John. She's the founder of Hope Pregnancy Center in Kalispell, Montana, and now leading a teen mom support group in Little Rock, Arkansas. Welcome, Trisha. Thank you so much for having me. It's great being here. I'm really excited to have you here. Really excited to chat about your book, Walk It Out, with the subtitle, The Radical Result of Living God's Word One Step at a Time. I think it just fits so well with our podcast and what we've already discussed with so many of our guests. But before we get into any of that, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, I was a teen mom, so I had my oldest son when I was um, 17, and then I prayed and prayed for God to bring me a future husband that would love him and love me and love my son. And, and he did that. I met and married John and then we had two more kids. Um, and so by the time I was 22, I had three kids wow. and was, uh, started homeschooling and, <laughs> um, wanted, wanted to be a writer and just thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm just going to write these wonderful books that are just going to inspire people all around the world. And, then I felt because I had faced teen pregnancy and it really was a group of women that reached out to me that time that really impacted my life. And at the time, my pastor asked if I'd be interested in helping to start a crisis pregnancy center in Montana. And I wasn't interested at all, but I told him I'd pray about it. And as I did, I just felt God just like not an audible voice at all, but I just thought about the women in my community that needed help and that needed hope like I received when I was a teen mom and felt like, yes, this is something I should do, which here I was, you know, a young mom with three kids helping to start this center. I had no idea. I had never worked outside the home before, except like at McDonald's. <laughs> and here <laughs> I was thrown into this. But it's just amazing that all the people that came forward to help and support us and that got up and running. And I started mentoring teen moms through there. And I still mentor them. We live in Little Rock, Arkansas now, but I still lead a teen mom support group here. And then as in the middle of all that, I just started writing, did first articles, and I worked on a book project with Focus on the Family, and then later started writing my own books. And now I am uh, just had number 70 that's about to come out. Wow. So it's, it's just been this awesome journey of I've always had kids at home. I've always been homeschooling, writing in the early mornings, afternoons, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> like at night. And, you know, just it's amazing how we just... If you're focused on something and set goals, how a little bit of time every day can really add up over the years. Wow. I feel bad just talking about one of your books. Maybe we'll have to, (laughs) you know, get together and kind of discuss maybe there's more that we can talk about. But I was uh, actually referred to you by Leanne. And she was telling me about this book, Walk It Out, The Radical Result of Living God's Word One Step at a Time. Uh, And it really intrigued me because I really felt like it's something that I focus a lot here on our podcast about living our mission, you know, having a passion, you know, the Mm -hmm. things that God really wants us to be. And I really could relate with the beginning of your book when you talk about how, you know, as a Christian, you're doing all the things that maybe you're told to do of studying your scriptures and, you know, praying and doing all those things, but you're just kind of like, you're going through the motions, maybe you're not necessarily like really listening to that inspiration, I guess that's coming. Do you want to maybe let's, I guess, go back and maybe talk about kind of the inspiration behind this book and why you decided to write it? 
Absolutely. You know, and I think what you're saying, you know, I, I do talk about the book and so many people, we want to do the right thing. Like we honestly want to get, live good lives and we want to help and serve other people. But I think so many times as we're trying to do the right thing, we feel like I don't feel fulfilled in this and I yeah. just feel like I'm not making an impact or it's just we're so busy that we sometimes feel like we're ne neglecting our family. And I felt all of those things. And when I actually stopped trying to just do the good thing and saying, okay, what do I uniquely have to give to other people? So I mentioned, you know, helping to start Hope Pregnancy Center in Montana. At first, I thought this is going to take too much time away from my family. But once I was there, and especially working with the teen moms that were facing the same kind of stuff that I faced when I was a teen mom, feeling like my life is over, I'm not going to be successful. I remember like driving to a meeting and being tired because I'd been homeschooling all day or taking care of my kids or writing and thinking like, I don't have time for this. And why am I doing this? And just being really tired and then just going there. And as I encouraged other people and taught them about parenting. And, you know, we talked about car seat safety. I mean, any little thing. And then walking out of there feeling like I feel so good because I knew I was making a difference. And I knew that it was something that I can give them that could help them be better moms and, and then help hopefully help their kids to grow up in a better environment. It was just like, I felt like this is definitely a mission that I have because it fits uniquely with who I am. And yes, you know, I, you know, taught Sunday school and I could teach Sunday school or I could lead a Bible study and I could do those things well, but it was not who God created me to be or who I can impact on a personal level if I was just doing those other things. And so really it's kind of stopping the good things that we're doing to really seeing what am I uniquely called to that I can impact people on a, on a way that maybe other people can't. I love that because a lot of times um, I love the word, the fact that you use, you know, your unique calling, because I think a lot of times we take our cues from other people of like what they think we should be doing. And we don't really listen to that internal voice very well. And a lot of us can't even recognize that voice. Do you know what I mean? I, I was talking to my son just yesterday about how God, maybe I just feel like part of our duty here is to really be able to come in tune with hearing God's word. Do you know what I mean? Like he, sometimes, like I said, we we're reading the scriptures or whatever, we're leading the life that everyone thinks we should, but we're not listening to that internal voice of what God really thinks that we should do. And that's, I think that's a challenge. You know, that's part of whole taking off that natural man and really seeing with our spiritual eyes. <laughs> I think I just absolutely slattered, slattered my <laughs> ideas. <laughs> but, I, I love that. And I, I think, you know, when you're talking to your son about like, we need to pay attention to what's unique for us and our specific calling from God is that when I thought about starting a crisis pregnancy center or helping to start the crisis pregnancy center, I thought, okay, this is all going to be up to me. Like I need to go out and recruit the volunteers and I need to know the right things to say to the young women. And what I discovered is if it's, some, if it's from God and he's putting it on our hearts and revealing it in his word, that he's already at work around us. And one of my favorite Bible studies is Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby that really showed like God's already at work. And so he's already working in people's hearts, your heart and my heart and your son's heart and whoever else is out there. He's already putting his messages of hope in their hearts. And when we step out to do what we're supposed to do, maybe we'll encourage someone else to step out to do what they're supposed to do. So when I started um, Help Start Hope Pregnancy Center, there's me and two other ladies and we were both young moms with young kids at home. And our pastor kind of like oversaw it. But we had our first training and at that first training, 35 women showed up to help, wow. which I was thinking five, like maybe we have <laughs> five women from the, there was 35 there. And so some people, you know, help with the finances, which you would not want me working on the finances. <laughs> like I'm more the visionary, like, let's do this. And, and another people connected us with uh, a church in town that had a parsonage that was empty that we can use for our center. And, and so all these people with their unique gifts came together and I, it showed me like, 
God just needed me to ter- take the first step to say, okay, we're going to do this. And I was kind of like the organizational one that would write stuff up and send the stuff out to church bulletins for people to announce or put it in the paper. Or I wrote a grant that helped us to get some money. So I, I used my writing skills that I was still developing to do these things. And then God had all these other people that he was already you know, talking to their hearts too. And it just this all of a sudden, a year later, we have this huge center that is able to help young women and not only, you know, just say, yes, you're making a good choice. And yes, you know, you can be a mom, but here's diapers, here's clothes, here's job training, here's all these (laughs) things that can help you. And all these moving parts God had already planned out. And so I think so many times when we think about our unique calling and what God has for us, we forget that he is at work already. And we're stepping into something that's already in motion. And it's just like being able to go along for the ride and see what he has prepared for us. Wow. I feel like that's a personal chastisement for me because that's really, I think, uh, especially the last three years, I struggled with really, I don't, almost didn't want to ask God <laughs> what I was supposed to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I was like, I'm already feeling just way overwhelmed, way whatever. And when I finally said, okay, I'm going to follow you, that was what penetrated my heart. Like, I've been working on this for a long time. And, you know, finally you're coming into it. And and that's what, like, my I, the worry, though, came of, like, how is this all going to work? And and that is exactly what I felt like. God, uh, God told me, it's like, I've been working on this for quite a while. Yeah. You have a place, you know, I have a place for you and you have to just listen. So I feel like that's um, maybe one of the challenges that I have, but what were some of the challenges that you had along the way or that you've helped others kind of grasp with writing this book? And then what did you learn from those challenges? Yeah, you know, I think because a, a lot of the chapters are based on my personal stories, one of the big challenges, okay, now how can your story apply to other people? So, yeah. you know, I took that talking about the pregnancy center and then talk about, okay, other people, you know, the encouragement for them is to, we need to clear white space on their calendars. Like I had to do that before I could start with the center. I had to say no to some other things. So, you know, encouraging people to clear white space on their calendars, encouraging people not be afraid to step out. So it's really seeing how my story applies to other people. And it's been so encouraging. I have some pre-reader copies out, you know, to you and to other people who are interviewing me and some friends that are helping me promote the book. And it's amazing. Once they get the book in their hands, now they're saying, okay, yes, I know what God's calling me specifically to do and I'm applying it. So one of my friends who has already contacted me, she's felt for a while that she should open her home up and do like a community event. So they're going to have a barbecue at their house and invite neighbors just so neighbors can get to know each other. And so I'm like, yes, that succeeded because it's not only me telling my story, but encouraging people to see what God is doing in their own lives and encouraging them to step out. So that was really kind of the biggest challenge in writing it is, okay, this is my story, but how does it apply to other people out there? And it's been cool already to see from the pre-readers that they are are seeing that, that, that they can make the same changes in their lives and see God show up and see that God has been working in their communities or in their world or their little homes too. Yeah, I think we kind of talked about that before we start recording of how it doesn't necessarily have to be something grand. And then me reading your story, I mean, taps in that personal inspiration of like, I can relate to it. I have some, there's some, uh, because of you were so authentic. I mean, especially talking about some of the struggles that you had early in your life, but really authentic to that. It helped to open my heart. And then I was, you know, able to use that, that as well to, to help, you know, push me along. It doesn't, and it doesn't have to be like, ginormous things of necessarily writing a book or something. But like you said, I mean, the friend that's just having a barbecue, you know, how is that going to help somebody else down the road? You know, something smaller like that. Yeah. And it's been so fun. Another the short story that ties into this where God is already at work and he's already like connecting people and putting us kind of on the path. Another fun story that I share, I think it's in chapter six, is the first time I went to the Czech Republic, I went there researching for a book. So I was with friends and they were researching and I was along for the ride and just fell in love with the country. Our family ended up going on a mission trip there with our three older kids when they were teenagers before we adopted any of the other ones. And then my daughter felt called 
to go back as a, a missionary short term. But the cool thing was when we were there, we were able to pass out Bibles on one of the streets there in the Czech Republic. Oh, wow. And when I got home, I was telling one of my friends, this because it's a former communist country. And we were just able to talk to especially young people came up and wanted a Bible and said, you know, I want to I've been wanting to read a Bible. Thank you so much. I can't believe this is free. And, you know, we're <laughs> able to talk to people um, in English because they learn English in school. And when I got home, I was telling one of my friends about that. And she asked me what town we were in. And I told her the name of the town. Haraditz Karava. And she's like, oh my goodness, when she was in college in the late 70s, she smuggled Bibles into that town, oh, the very wow. same town where I was passing out Bibles on the street. She had smuggled them in. I'm like, this is no coincidence. Like, yeah. you know, God has been at work there. He was worked there in the late 70s. And then knowing her, I was able to, you know, be on the street openly hand out Bibles. And then just taking our, our kids along and on the trip, they got to see the world. And our daughter ended up going first to us, just a summer missionary, and then one year. And now she's full-time missionary over there. And she also teaches English in the university over there. And she lives there full-time. She married oh, a Czech wow. man. I was wow. just Skyping with her right before we talked. And it's like, I'm just one step in the story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Robin, my friend Robin was one step in the story and I was another step in the story. And now Leslie's a step in the story. So we're just stepping into this, this thing that God's already doing. If we're willing, like I could have just said, Oh, mission trip, that's going to be too hard, you know, cause I helped organize it and I can't fit that into my life right now. And it would have just stopped. Like the story would have stopped there. But when we're willing to take those steps of faith, it's amazing how we just continue being able to carry that story and let other people join in with us. And um, it's amazing what can happen after that. Yeah, it's kind of like a snowball rolling down the hill. You know, by the time it yeah. gets to the bottom, it's this ginormous thing, but it didn't start out that way. You know, definitely one tiny little, little stone, you know, created this ginormous thing. So that's just awesome. What a great story. How do you feel like your paradigm changed over time and with experience? I always love to hear how, you know, when you're, you're first starting something to now, how do you, how do you feel differently about it? You know, when I first started, I, and I've mentioned this a little bit, I thought it was all going to be up to me. <laughs> like This is <was> all <laughs> On my shoulders, whether it was homeschooling my kids or starting to write or leading a mission trip. I mean, I just would think, OK, I'm going to have to do everything here. And what I've discovered is that there's people out there that are also kind of on the same mission and that we are joining together. So we're working together. So I guess I think when it comes to like we often hear the words, my mission, my purpose, my <laughs> calling. And yes, we do have that individually, but mine is connected to yours and somebody else's and you add one plus one and you get, you know, and then you add another person that they get three and pretty soon it starts building. So I just helped me to take it from just being focused on me and then being worried because I know I can't do it all. <laughs> like I know my limitations. I know that even as a homeschooling mom, I know like I am limited and, you know, I can't remember how to do geometry or whatever it is. I always would think about, so I'm limited and I can only do so much. And I think it's really changed because I realized that there's other resources and there's other people that I can count on that can come together and that we can work together. And it's not all up to me. And that's such a freeing thing. Like when I need help, when I need support, when I need encouragement, it will be there for me. And also that God has control of all of it. And so another cool story is when I was working on some of my novels, I've written World War II novels, and I was able to interview uh, World War II veterans who lived through liberating concentration camps and freeing Holocaust survivors. And so it was an amazing experience. And in one of my books I was working on, I was writing about some looms in Belgium. So these are homes where German girls would go and they would get pregnant by Nazi officers because they were going to raise up children for the Third Reich. And this is this is one element of what one of the novels that I was writing. And I've always been able to like talk to veterans. And this was, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So a lot of veterans were still alive and and get the experiences. But I couldn't find any information on this. Leave rooms of our own home. And this is like a main element through my story because there's going to be a child rescued from there. And all this, you know, it's a main part. And I could not find information about 
this maternity home in Belgium that was run by the Nazis. And so I just remember just praying and saying, God, you were there. You were in Belgium <laughs> in 1952 when this book is sent. You know what's happening. Like, just point me to the right book or resource. And I remembered that I had met a man from Belgium and he was also interviewing the same World War II veterans I was interviewing. And I got his name and his email. And so I thought, well, I'll just email him and see if he can maybe point me to a resource. So I contacted him and I told him what I was looking for. And maybe there was a book that he knew of that he could point me to, or if there's a website, he could translate a couple of paragraphs for me uh-huh. or anything. And he said, e- email me back within 24 hours. He goes, oh, I'm so glad um, you contacted me. And yes, I can help you. He said, I actually grew up in the town where this home, Liebermorn's, Liebermorn's home is. Wow. And one of my friends, now a museum, and one of my friends is the curator of this museum. What do you need to know? And oh I thought, my goodness. God, out of all the people in Belgium, <laughs> you like, <laughs> connected me with the one person who would be able to provide exactly what I needed. And so, again, it just before I just thought this is all going to be me and it's all the pressure and all the stress is on me. But instead, just seeing that you know, there's almost unlimited resources that God can connect us to the right person, the right information, the right resources at the right time to help on the journey. And so that's totally how my my mind has shifted since then. Oh, wow. Well, it kind of reminds me, you know, when I said earlier, I almost don't dare ask God, you know, what I should be doing because or what he wants me to do, because I'm afraid it's all going to fall on me, you know, but like we discussed before, that he's already got this in place and it's not going to be the struggle that I think it's going to be. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not going to be totally this thing that's just waiting on me that he's also there helping and has got the resources to help us really overcome that. And, you know, to do the things that he's asked us to do because, you know, he wants to see it happen. So yeah. And that's what the subtitle is the radical results. I mean, sometimes it's radical, like, People are like, what? Why are you like, doing this? Or why are you adopting kids? Or why are you writing these books? I mean, it doesn't make sense. But just knowing that God will show up is radical. Yeah. When it's really the direction you're supposed to go to, a lot of times it helps you live life more joyfully. Like there's been so many times I'm like, I'm already busy. But then when I start moving in that direction, all of a sudden I don't feel so overwhelmed or whatever, because it's really, do you understand what I'm saying? Like it's, yeah, it's it's like regenerating you, you know, like it's moving you, it's giving you more energy type of thing because it's in a direction that you're supposed to be going. Absolutely. And and then it makes you realize that some of the stuff that you're busy about maybe wasn't important at all or yeah. that important. I used to have like a really clean house. Like, <laughs> you know, like I'm a firstborn child and firstborn grandchild to very neat house sleepers. And I would spend all day Saturday and lots of time cleaning and organizing. And then now that I'm writing books and I've, we've adopted all these kids, my house, like it's presentable. Most of the time, but <laughs> you know, there's like all these people in here and I'm never quite caught up in laundry right now on my desk. I have like a pile of papers sitting on the floor that I need to sort through and mail and it's OK. Like, yeah. you know, it's yeah. OK because I'm doing things that bring me greater joy and greater purpose. And I do like a clean house like that's important, but it's less important when I realize like there's kids that have homes now that were in the foster care system and that had no hope. And now they have a home. And so some of the stuff maybe that we think is so important and it does, it definitely does keep us busy. Like yeah. I could spend all day cleaning my house and that will definitely be busy, but that's not as important as these other things that only we can do, like adopting kids or yeah. writing books or doing a podcast or yeah. whatever that's <laughs> uniquely for us. Like it just, the like house being clean just lowered on the important scale when I started doing these other things that really bring me joy and really just are part of my mission. Yeah, that maybe God didn't put you on that on the earth to just clean the house. I have to think that all the time because I'm a I am a total neat freak. So I totally get I understand that. But I have felt that lately that this isn't what God wants you to be doing with your time. It's just cleaning my house all the time. So right. And, um, let's really dive into your book and talk about it. Can you just give us some points of ways that you think that would help a person walk out their life's mission? 
Yeah, absolutely. In one of the places in the book, I talk about finding your life theme. And my friend Robin uh, Jones, again, she was actually the one that smuggled Bibles into the Czech Republic. <laughs> Our stories are intertwined a lot, which if you re- you know read through the whole book, you'll see it. But one of the things she had us do, I was at a writer's conference that she taught at, is to write a timeline of your life and to um, write down the high points and the low points and see if you could find some themes that may give you a hint of your life mission. So for me, I was born to a single mom. She got pregnant in college and my biological dad moved before he found out that she was pregnant. This is in the early seventies. So it's like, there's no Facebook or email or (laughs) all that type of stuff. So he's like out of the picture. I didn't meet him till I was 28. I was born to a single mom. I became a teen mom. And then I felt God um, helping me to lead a a open up crisis pregnancy center and mentoring teen moms. And So if I look at these high points and low points on my life map, like my life grid, I can see that teen pregnancy, unplanned pregnancy, unexpected pregnancy, you know, being a single mom is like a theme in my life, but it's not like a theme negatively. I could use it to see like there's other young women that need hope and need encouragement. Another life theme is that when I was in the sixth grade, we moved near a library. And so childhood summers after that were definitely spent at the library. After I became a Christian, I started reading Christian books and it really inspired me. Um, A friend told me she wanted to be a writer and that excited me. I started writing. And so I could see these, this is a mission of my life. Like these high points and low points have to do with writing and teen pregnancy and adopting kids. And I mean, you could just see as I go through my life, like the themes stand out. And so when it comes to when you take time to plot your mission or plot your life, you could see kind of where your mission is. And then if someone says, hey, I want to know if you want to be involved in this pottery ministry and we're going to bring in inner city kids and we're going to teach them how to make pottery and it's going to really you know, show them, I could say that's an awesome ministry, but that's not my ministry. Like yeah. I'm working with teen moms. So it just helps you kind of weigh the themes that are in your life and where you might be called to. So that's one key point about your life's mission. And I think another key point, as I mentioned earlier, is you just have to create that white space in your calendar to be able to walk and take out these steps. There are seasons in my life I was so busy. I had kids in t-ball and ballet and doing all these things and volunteering that I had been that way when I felt called to open help the pregnancy center. I wouldn't have been able to do it because my life was so full. But a little bit prior to that, I really felt, well, in fact, with my husband's encouragement to clear out and create white space on my calendar. So if we're too busy doing these other things, then we don't have time to do the things we're called to, which is the second point. And then I think the third point when it comes to your life mission is sometimes we need to find healing in our own life before we could help other people. So in addition to being a teen mom, I actually had an abortion when I was 15, which is something that I really regret. And personally, I had to learn to forgive myself for that before I can step out in these other areas and help. So even before I helped start the pregnancy center, I had to read my Bible and pray. And I went through a Bible study and found healing for that. And sometimes we want to help other people. We want to inspire other people, but we need to kind of work on ourselves first (laughs) and get some healing there and kind of forgive ourselves or deal with stuff from our own past before we can set out. So um, those are just really three things that have helped me and that I do talk about in the know our theme once we have white space, once we have healing from our own past and then are willing to take those steps, it's amazing how everything will fall into place because we've done kind of the the heart work before we step out. Well, and I loved how you were talking about low points, you know, of your life, because I think that a lot of times when uh, we have low points in our life, at least for me, I've, I am almost embarrassed by them and I'm always running from them. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, but, but maybe, and that goes along really nicely with the healing and trying yes. to forgive yourself. But, and sometimes when we can see the low points, we forgive ourselves over some of those things mistakes that we made in the past, it helps us be able to see that that that's part of our mission. Um, For a long time, I had regrets like that. That's like, oh, I was so stupid here, so dumb here. And I really saw how that helped me to be able to 
grow in those areas. Do you know what I mean? Like, and then I, it changed my view that it wasn't necessarily a mistake. It was all part of my mission, but sometimes you have to go through some things to really be able to use it for a greater good down the road. Like in God's eyes, it was never a mistake. It was all part of my walk. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It was, it was where it was meant to be. And, and I think like our world, I mean, to go along with a carving out the white space in a, I think that is our number one uh, societal problem anymore is Mm -hmm. that we almost crave to be busy. And I think in my life, the busyness helped me not deal with stuff too. Do you know what I mean? Like it it helped me not heal because I was so busy that I couldn't really focus on those things. And I did it by design, you know, so I didn't have to. But when we kind of can take a step back and stop the busyness and it helps us really become a person who can forgive ourselves. I was thinking about this concept when uh, when I was reading through your book, kind of, and you could tell me if this goes with it or whatever, but one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about lately is the idea of repentance. And, you know, I'm not a person, I don't, I'm nice to people. I'm, I consider myself a good mom now. I'm not the yelling, screaming mom anymore. And, and I mean, there's, there's not a lot of things, you know, I'm not out murdering anybody. <laughs> Right, right. But I was really thinking about how repentance is really important to it's not necessarily for the bad things that we do in our life. It's always to make us like kind of come back, step back into our humility and then focus ourselves more in the direction that God wants us to do. You know what I mean? It's a positive thing. It's absolutely sometimes when we can recall, like it's not necessarily like, oh, you need to repent here you need to move in this direction, not necessarily. Do you know what, do you know what I mean? I always thought of repentance as a bad thing. <laughs> right. Sometimes we have to acknowledge something in our lives to be able to move forward. So. Absolutely. We teach our kids that repentance is, um, you know, of course, saying you're sorry, but also turning the opposite direction and doing the opposite. <laughs> so <laughs> doing the right, doing the right thing. And even our my little uh, 10 year old, we were talking about that today when we did our Bible study together. She was like, repentance is turning the other way and doing the right <laughs> thing. I'm like, you're right. So I think some of the choices I made as a teenager being sexually active, now I'm turning the other way and I'm talking to my teens and then other young women about different choices. You know, so it, it is kind of the two sided coin. Like these are the things we regret, but because we have that story, people are going to be more open to listening to us because we walk the road. You know, so we've been there and it, the Bible talks about giving comfort to those in the areas that you've received comfort. And so the areas where I've struggled and people have helped me, I'm able to now help other people in those same areas. So yeah, we think of it, we definitely have to humble ourselves, but the humbling is good because it makes us realize that there are other people that maybe need the same hope or encouragement or messages of encouragement from God that we can give them and they'll say, okay, you, you walk through that. So I will listen to you. Like you've been where I've been. And so it does make a huge difference. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Hey, Firestarters, this is Mark, producer of The Luminous Mind. If you're like me, the thought of going out to the store and shopping is enough to make you want to crawl in a hole and hide. If that's you, then do your shopping online through Amazon. Just go to theluminousmind.net, click on the Amazon link, and shop away. Also, most of the books and resources that Rebecca and her guests discuss can be found on our Amazon links as well. Again, if you're like me, you have already accidentally signed up for Amazon Prime. So most of those purchases should have free shipping as well. Good luck. Art is born. Welcome back to The Luminous Mind with Trisha Goyer, helping you walk out your life's mission. Those three points that we talked about before, I mean, the low points that until we can come to that, you know, acceptance or that healing or that forgiveness, 
we're still keeping it secret. Do you know what I mean? And, right. and in, in the secrecy, there's no authenticity. You know, there's no, there's no being real about it. You can't talk to somebody about it because there's that feeling of shame that you have there. But when we can kind of get past that feeling of shame, all of a sudden we can open up to people and be really authentic. And then it changes their lives too. Yeah. And so for so many years, I lived as a closed person because I didn't want anyone to know about my abortion or my teen pregnancy. So I had this wall up and I was so just actually seen talk- as like a good Christian person. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's what I wanted. I wanted like everyone. To, oh, she's a good Christian mom. And I was just talking with my daughter on Skype about this. That looking back now, I could see that that wall kept me not only from dealing with the pain, but it kept out some of the good stuff too in my life. It kept out some of the joy. So a Hallmark commercial, everyone would be like getting teary eyed and, and the joy was or the emotion wasn't able to penetrate because I just had this wall up. Like so yeah. everything was not going through or I even was telling her like when you guys would get hurt when you were little, she's 25 now, like you'd fall and get hurt and I'd feel like, oh no, they're hurt. But that I didn't have the compassion like seeping through me that I do now because I had that wall up because you're just trying to protect yeah. yourself. You're trying to protect your heart. And so you're trying to hold out the bad stuff, but the good stuff isn't getting on too. And now I was just reading in homeschool. We just finished the uh, biography of Corey Tin Boone and who helped hide Jews during World War II and hit it up and was taken to a concentration camp. And I'm like crying as I'm reading this book. Mm-hmm. And the, my kids are like, you're crying again. I'm like, yes, I know. But <laughs> I'm able to feel the emotions because the wall is down. Like I have to protect myself or my heart and I'm able to cry with other people and give compassion to other people and really care because I don't have the wall and I don't feel like I'm hiding. So it makes a huge difference and it's hard. It's like hard stuff, letting that (laughs) wall down and dealing with those things, but it's so worth it. Like if we do the work and turn to God and turn to his scriptures, it's so worth it when we get to the other side. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, this is totally a different kind of topic, but I don't know if anyone ever listens to Dave Ramsey, but he talks about how people hang on to their money and they have this closed fist, you know, and but when Mm -hmm. our fist is closed, we can't receive anything either. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's only when we finally open that fist and let things move freely, if things go, but they also come back to us. Do you know what I mean? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, we kind of talked about some of the feedback that you've received from early people that you've given PDFs to or, you know, to kind of preview your book. But what other feedback have you received about it and maybe how it's helped other people be more successful? Yeah, you know, one thing that I get from a lot of people is it they are taking time to look at their calendar and they are taking time <laughs> to consider like their unique things that they're called to. And it's OK to say no, like they're they're learning like it's okay to say no to these other things that are really good things but may not be for this season of your life and then a lot of people it's I think giving them that faith to take the first step like you don't have to have it all figured out before you take the first step uh, whatever you feel like you're called to just feeling be willing to take the first step and it's super fun like I have already seen some reviews on Goodreads even though the book isn't released yet the Goodreads lets you put them up early and I'd love just reading through And just saying that, you know, all the things that I struggled with, like, it's okay now because it's for a purpose. Like other people are being able to use that for their benefit. And so that's really fun to see that, you know, as I'm authentic and share my struggles, other people, like it's kind of a stepping stone for them to take their own struggles and their own callings and to step off from there. Yeah. Many times what makes faith faith is that you have to take a few steps in the dark before, Mm -hmm. you know, you really can understand where you're going. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you have to have the courage to just step off and walk there a few steps in the dark before the rest of your mission or or the things that you're supposed to be doing kind of come to you. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, I think the more you do it too, the more you take the steps in the dark and then it's like, oh wait, God showed up. (laughs) Like, oh wait, there's 35 people at this training. And then, oh wait, God brought me someone that could help me with the research for this book. And the next time it gives me the ability to take bigger steps of faith because I know that God is like already there. And so a lot more confidence. Yeah. Yeah. We always pray for faith, like, Lord, give me more faith. And he's like, take a step 
and then you'll have more <laughs> faith because I've like already got your answer there. And so that's really cool to, yeah. to know that the it's like a muscle that we use when we take steps of faith and we become more used to that. We use that muscle and our faith will grow. Our faith won't grow when we just say, God, give me more faith. Like <laughs> it's he's like, you're, you're just sitting there. Like, yeah. how can I give you more faith when you're just sitting there? But just take that little mustard seed of faith that you have and take a step and and then your faith will grow because you're like, oh, God did show up like he is on this walk and he is on this journey with me. What would you say to people, though, that take those few steps of faith and then they feel like God didn't show up? I mean, have you ever seen that in your life or dealt with somebody who might have? I mean, I've heard that a lot like, well, I tried that, but God never did. You know what I mean? Right. And I think my writing journey has been an excellent example of that. <laughs> so my first conference was in 94. And so for five solid years, I wrote stuff and I submitted stuff. I even got an agent during that time and she she submitted stuff to get published and nothing got published. And one time I actually had a children's book series that it looked like it was going to get published. And they're like, yes, we want to do nine books in the series. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. You know, God, I love how you orchestrated this. And then they came back and they closed that division and they decided not to give me a contract. And so for years, I felt like, I was just going into a wall like this is this is I felt like I was still wanting to write. So that desire was there. But everything I tried to do wasn't working. And I would go to a conference for teens and I'd go home and try to write a book for teens or I'd go to another conference and like we're looking for uh, inspirational romance. So I'd go and try to write an inspirational romance and I just would get a ton of rejection and I didn't understand like God I thought I was doing what you called me to do but I kept going like I didn't throw in the towel I kept just like trying and it wasn't till 2000 so this is like six years later as I've been on this journey getting lots of rejection that when I was on that research trip in Austria I came across the story that became my first novel about the liberation of a concentration camp by 23 American uh, uh, soldiers they didn't even know that the camp was there and they came upon it and Germans surrendered to them and these Holocaust survivors poured out of the gates and the first one in taking care of them was a Nazi officer's wife she hadn't um, been happy with what had been happening but she could not do anything about it because you know people were basically silenced if you spoke out against what the Nazis were doing and as the camp was liberated she went in and started feeding and caring for the prisoners. And I heard the story and like, this is amazing. And I asked my friends, like, are you going to be using the story in your books? I was traveling with two other writers and like, no, we already have our books we're writing. I'm like, I want to write the story. And so I went home and talked to my agent. She's like, oh my goodness, you have to write that story. And I contacted the veterans organization and right away they're like, come and interview our veterans. We're having a reunion. We want you to come like, Everything fell into place. And From Dust and Ashes is the name of the book that became my first novel. And so I see all those years prior, it wasn't like I was on the wrong path. I was on the right path, which was writing. I was just like not on the right topics. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it was like God was saying, I have, I have this story for you. So it was the right path. I was just getting distracted and running off on rabbit trails as I was on the path. But that's okay because all those years, like I learned a lot of stuff. I learned about writing. I I wrote. I went to conferences. I met people. So it was still part of the journey. It just took six years to get me to where I was ready to have the the book that was for me. And, And so it's I think so many times we think we know what the results will be. And so when it's not that result, we think, okay, God's not there, but maybe just God has a different result than we had planned. And so, and it might be training. I mean, like we talked about before the low points of your life. I mean, that's why mapping those out as well might be really helpful because you might be able to see that it's a training, you know, and then like I talked (laughs) about before, instead of feeling, feeling the shame or whatever, I now understand that it was part of my path that it was meant to be, you know, so Sometimes when uh, we have the faith, we take the steps and things don't turn out like we think right off the bat. We're not an instant success. It doesn't. I mean, it's it's all part of our training. Is that kind of where you're going? Right. Absolutely. And I would not have done well, I think, if I had been an instant success. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? I would have missed so much along the way if all of a sudden I wrote a book 
you know, the first year I started and all of a sudden it was a success. And like, there was so much that I learned on the journey and I wouldn't have come across the veterans and heard their stories. Like, it's just, I'm so glad that it took six years. Like during the six years, I was not happy. <laughs> like I wanted to publish, but looking back now, I am so thankful that I had those years and I had that training. I think it's actually harder now for writers because when I started in 94, there wasn't the internet and all these websites and all these contests and all these <laughs> writers groups. And it was just me with the, my computer and God, like, you know, <laughs> I think it is harder now because people feel like, okay, I can self publish. I can have my book on Kindle by next year. And maybe they're not ready. Like their work isn't ready. So I'm, I'm thankful for all those years where even though there was rejection, I was learning and I was growing and I was practicing. And yeah, it's the steps along the way that we need to become the person that can handle the the book published or the whatever success that is at the end of that. Yeah, it keeps us a little more humble and, and all of that too, to be able to really be able to turn our heart like like we talked about before to the direction we're supposed to go. So that's great. Let's kind of talk a little bit about your mentoring, you know, what you've learned from mentoring other people. I mean, through the years, it sounds like, especially with your um, pregnancy crisis centers, I mean, you have, you have done a ton just mentoring others. What do you feel like you've learned from that? You know, I think what I've learned is that I have something to offer other people, but they also have things to offer me and their life views and what they experience are things that I can learn from too. I especially learned this when we moved to Arkansas and our church was in the inner city. It's a multi-ethnic inner city church. And so those people that are very different than me, all kinds of ethnic backgrounds and low, low income. So the moms that are coming you know, some of them are basically homeless. They're living from house to house. And I would just get so overwhelmed. Like I need to feed them and mm -hmm. I need to take food to them. And like all these things, like I want to be the rescuer. And that's not what God called me to do. He called me to open up our doors for the support group. And we do give them diapers and clothes, but really to be there kind of emotionally and spiritual encouragement, because I can't help every teen mom in Little Rock, Arkansas and feed her. Like that's yeah. not... So it's just really, first of all, like seeing what is my role. And then second, just being willing to listen and see where they come from and see why they have the view that they have and what challenges they are and how I can learn something from them. So I've learned about relationship things from them as I've seen them struggle with relationships and, and realize like, oh, this is something that I grew up like as a core value that maybe they didn't grow up as a core value. You know, a lot of them grew up with single moms or maybe was raised by a grandma. And so they have no core value of marriage. And so I was a teen mom praying that God would bring me someone to you know marry and have a have the traditional home and they have like they don't care they have no desire to get married so just seeing like how people's thoughts are and then being able to encourage them to maybe like well maybe consider marriage or maybe yeah. consider these different areas and I just let me know so much about just how their worldviews are have really just helped me kind of realize the worldviews I guess I was just given growing up but also helps me to like look to the Bible and say, what do I really believe about this? And why is this important? Instead of just like, oh, yeah, everyone thinks this way. Yeah. When I think the questions help solidify our faith. A lot of times as Christians, we, you know, don't want to question, well, why is is this thing that I believe really important? But sometimes it helps solidify that view. You know, it's not a bad thing to question and ask God what his opinion is on the matter without, you know, I just believe it just helps solidify that faith. And maybe it helps us dispel myths that have been put there that aren't necessarily, you know, like, like the whole idea of not talking about your teen pregnancy and all of that kind of stuff. I feel like that's kind of a Christian myth, like you have to look a certain way, you know, that all Christians look this way, when in reality, that's not that's not what God wants out of us. You know what I mean? It's he absolutely doesn't, he doesn't want us to all look the same. And that is a myth that when you finally challenge it, it helps dispel that. But in other ways, it might help strengthen that, you know, like, no, this is really important to him. And this is what I need to teach. I wonder, too, like, if maybe some of your mentors helped encourage the strong marriage, like you, maybe you saw that in their life of how powerful that was for them. And then you wanted that as well. Did that absolutely yeah and I think like when it comes to marriage I saw some good examples of that actually my mom married my stepdad when I was four and they got a divorce so 
that wasn't a good example, but I did see like my grandparents and different people that had strong marriages. So I had a positive outlook on that. But a lot of these moms, like we've asked them after months of them saying like, I'm never getting married. And I thought there was about 25 young women in the room. And I said, how many have you seen a good marriage modeled for you? And only one girl out of 25 raised her hand, like that had parents that were together that would consider it a good marriage. So I'm like, wow, this is like, so I'm, I'm preaching to them don't have sex until marriage or all these other things that, you know, I'm talking to them, but they're, they're like, like, well, I've, then I'd be never celibate seen, my whole life. <laughs> right. They've never seen this good example of marriage. And so it just having seen what other people are facing, like it's so easy to judge other people and like you are just doing it all wrong until you understand where they're coming from. And then I could talk to them about, well, there is a, there is possible ways to have good relationships <laughs> and talk about what those means and what to, what to look for and what to look for in a guy. And it's, it's cool because one of our young moms got married last year and it's, you know, and to her, her children's or one of her children's father, and they have a good relationship now, but you know, she's been coming every week for four years to our teen mom support group. And so she learned through our group about marriage and what marriage can be where she didn't have that in her everyday life. And then even I think the stereotype of, um, oh, you can't go to church when you're a single mom or a teen mom or you're pregnant, like the church people are going to kick you out. And I think that has been one of the things that blessed me when I was pregnant teen. It was my mom and grandma's Bible study group that reached out to me and they gave me a a baby shower and they invited me to church. And because of them, then I was able to turn to God and like, okay, if they love me, maybe you still love me too. (laughs) And, you know, our support group is on a Thursday night, but it's in the church. And that's sometimes the first time they've ever walked into a church. And for them to know, like, there's people that love them and care for them. And I always tell them, you know, if Jesus was walking on earth today, he would be hanging out with us in our, our teen mom support group. Like he <laughs> hung out with people that other people turn their back on. And they're like, what? Like, <laughs> they just think of like, you have to be dressed in the suit or in the dress in the hills. And, and so just kind of getting rid of that myth, just let them know that that's not how the Bible is. Like maybe society has set it up that way, but that's not how it should be. And so it does, like you were saying, it helps me to like, why do I believe this? And is this a traditional thing or is this like a biblical (laughs) thing? And really look at that. And the more I do that, it's helped me. Like this is important, like not wearing a dress on Sunday. Like that's not the focus, but really reaching out to the poor. That is important. So (laughs) help me in my own life to say like, this is biblical. And maybe this is something that traditionally Americans do but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. We um, speak of ideals, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're all living them at that point. You know what I mean? I think it's important that we talk about high ideals, but also have the grace to realize that even though we're speaking of those ideals, it's it's not like we're going to be perfect or everyone around us is going to, you know what I mean? Like it's important. Like we talked about the ma- the marriage is important, but it's not like, we don't associate with people who choose other paths or whatever. Right. So exactly. That's great. Yeah. Or, you know, it's not, it's not important to wear a dress on Sunday. Like, yes, it is important to come and learn and it's okay. You know, some of them don't own a dress and it's okay. (laughs) Like most of the people in our church are not going to be wearing dresses. It's all right. But just, I think we just set up with like, this is what it's supposed to look like in America, in our, whatever, our generation. And actually no, like, If you like the Bible, it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I love that. Well, let's talk about maybe your website and how you're serving other people. I mean, we've talked a ton about that already, but maybe what they can find, people could find there. Absolutely. So the website is just trishagoyer.com. It's my name. And I've been blogging since I think 2007. Wow. So I was looking the other day and there's like over 3000 blogs on there. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of words (laughs) that are on there. And the fun thing is when I was trying to write these books and that never got published at these conferences, I would meet people that had magazines. And so I wrote some articles for them. And then later, once I opened my blog and started my blog, um, it's the same type of like help and encouragement. So maybe some of the blogs that people might find there are how to survive a strong willed child or how to pray for (laughs) your kids how to have quiet, how to develop a personal quiet time. So it's all things kind of that I've learned or I've all asked experts about, and then I'll write a blog about it. So there's a lot of like helps and how to's there's some recently, there's some that share some of my personal stories. And then 
I'm launching this new series for Walk It Out because walking it out isn't just me. Like I'm not the only ones that take steps of faith and have God show up, but there's other people, friends of mine who have done that. So I've asked a lot of my writer friends that have been published and have books and stuff to share their walk it out stories. And so the first one just was up there, but every few days through September and October, probably into November, because we're getting a lot of them. There'll be stories of people who have just taken steps of faith and how God showed up in their lives. The, one of them, a recent one, is my friend Tracy Steele, and she's a, a writer, and she talks about how her husband's in the military, and they had to do a short four-month trip to Little Rock, Arkansas, from Albuquerque, and she did not want to move. They had just got settled, and so she just had to take that step of faith like she would be able to find friends because she just felt like she was getting friends in Albuquerque as a military wife, and she had to trust that God would... Sh- bring friends. And right after she moved to Little Rock, her mom, I think with her in Kansas, got sick and got put on hospice. And she was able to rush home and be with her mom, which if she had been in Albuquerque, she wouldn't have gotten home in time. But because she was closer, she was Uh able to get home and have that step of faith that allowed her to be there for her mom's last day. But also, like I met Tracy when she was in Little Rock. And so that we're really good friends now. And so Mm -hmm. It's just amazing how that step of faith has just helped her. So my blog, I I try to just have a lot of encouragement and whether it's a helpful blog post or someone else's story that people can go there and hopefully read a couple blogs and then be encouraged and find help for their everyday life. Well, and like we talked about previously, that hearing other people's stories helps us see where our story is, too. You know, it helps us uh, maybe see those high and low points and, and places that we can. It gives us the courage to do, to be able to take those first few steps. I love that. Very helpful to look through that portion on your website. Extremely encouraging for other people. What do you feel like, you know, you've already written 70 books and you've done a ton of stuff, but do you have any long-term goals and how how is all this working into the legacy that you hope to leave? I, you know, I've never had the goal like I'm going to write 100 books or whatever. <laughs> it just happens. So my goal is to just be open to the next like book or project that God's given me. So that's a goal for our seven adopted kids. I'm homeschooling them. And my goal is just to, I told my husband to get them to be productive members of society who love Jesus. Like that is my goal. <laughs> Some of them we've adopted as older kids. So we've adopted two sibling groups. So the youngest uh, we adopted as an infant, but the oldest we adopted, she was 15 when we adopted her. I um, mean, she's a senior this year. We've had her a couple of years, but just, I think as a goal, so many times it gets easy to look like beyond our home, like to books yeah. or pregnancy centers or whatever. But really a lot of my goals right now are just like helping the kids in my house, like helping with reading and helping with math and helping them so they'll understand that being in foster care, they were moved around a lot and moved for different schools. And sometimes they miss different holes in their education. So maybe a eighth grader, like finally learning her multiplication tables. <laughs> it's like a goal. And that's just as important. And I think that's one thing God has really shown me over the years. And my grandma lives with us too. She's 87. Her birthday's coming up. She's almost 88. And loving the people in my house on a daily basis and um, helping them succeed or find God or sharing truth with them is just as important as like finishing a book. It's all his kingdom work. So those are my goals, just getting my kids so they can graduate from high school, (laughs) uh, fill in some of those holes and, you know, that I don't even need a nuclear physicist. I just, you know, if you have want to be a whatever work as a secretary somewhere, that is totally fine with me. Just to know that they love God and can do those things is a huge goal right now. Yeah. Well, and sometimes um, goals kind of help it so that we aren't walking out our our mission of what we're supposed to do too. And we get kind of stuck in our own ways, you know, or, or we have to kind of get out of, get out from under ourselves and, and really focus on what we're supposed to do. And sometimes that can be just the tiniest little things of being there for your kids. And that's going to make a huge impact in their future. Just like some of the ladies that kind of came around you, you know, they weren't, they weren't authors or brain surgeons or whatever, but they were there listening to you. And that was the most important thing. So I don't know how absolutely. You, that's great. Well, before we say goodbye, I feel like we have gone all over the place. <laughs> uh, we haven't really stayed with your book. And maybe maybe a lot of the stuff that we've discussed uh, just naturally talks about walking it out. But 
you know, before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words for our listeners? And then give us your contact information, how people can learn more about you and get the inspiration that we've talked about. Absolutely. Well, I think one of the things that kind of ties in, we were talking about just leaving uh, the legacy of uh, and just realizing that it's just sometimes our people in our home. And it's just as important <laughs> reaching them as people outside our home. And so I think the one thing is that if we want our kids or the people we mentor to go and do amazing things and to follow God and take steps of faith, we need to show them how to do it. Like we can tell them, but they will learn best when we model for them and when we show them how to do it. And then they'll be willing to take their steps of faith. You know, my daughter, who's a missionary now in the Czech Republic, when she first felt led to go there for a year, I'm like, okay, we're going to have to do some fundraising and we're going to do like spaghetti dinners and send out fundraising letters. And she's like, mom, I just feel like we're supposed to pray and God is just going to provide. I'm like, what? And she's like, remember when you prayed for the pregnancy center to find a building or when you prayed like, whatever she like pointed to these areas in my life. And she goes, and God showed up, didn't he? I'm like, yeah. She's like, so I think God will show up here too. And sometimes it's easier to take the steps of faith ourselves, but it's harder to see our kids taking those (laughs) steps of faith. But she prayed and God, and I share about this and walk it out, just God showed up in amazing ways and provided every penny she needed for her trip. And we did no spaghetti letters. And so I think just remembering that Our kids are watching, the people we're mentoring are watching, our neighbors are watching, and our Mm -hmm. steps of faith will not only impact and build our faith, but it'll build theirs too. Yeah. Talk about a legacy, right? I mean, that we're there. I mean, that's the the best legacy that we can live is just people using our examples of what we're doing in our own lives and trying to walk it out in their own lives. And then give us your contact information, how we can find out more about you. Yeah, my website is just trishagoyer.com and Trisha is T-R-I-C-I-A Goyer's G-O-Y-E-R.com. And on Facebook, I'm author Trisha Goyer on uh, Instagram, Trisha Goyer and Twitter, Trisha Goyer. Pretty much (laughs) if you put in my name, you'll find me everywhere. And I love to connect with readers and on Facebook, especially I, you know, if people leave comments, I try to get back right away. Kind of Facebook's my go-to place where I hang out the most. So I would love to connect. (laughs) <laughs> That's great. And again, her book is called Walk It Out, The Radical Result of Living God's Word One Step at a Time. Like I said, it was so intriguing to me, super fun. And it's about helping us to focus on our mission and our passions and things that God wants us to do to have faith, to be able to take those few steps. Again, you can find her website at trishagoyer.com. But we're going to be sure to link all the information that we've discussed today on our website. But thank you so much for coming on, Trisha, and joining us to help us light our minds on fire on this important topic of walking out our life's mission. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for inviting me. I really love talking to you. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Trisha Goyer, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list. Then check out the services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of illuminating content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education 